Uh, hello and welcome to part two uh, of the South American Files, uh, which is a, I suppose, a short and very brief overview of the South American nations, uh, a brief history and their love affair of football, which granted is incredibly difficult to do in 40 minutes, but I think we've got the people for that job. So episode one, we looked at Colombia uh, and now we're moving on to Brazil. Now, before we, uh, before we make an official start, obviously, as you can see, the two regular co-hosts are right here, sat just, it's like the Brady Bunch, this, for those who remember it, <laughs> sat <laughs> just below me. Um, first of all, Steve, you all right? Very well, thanks, Stu, very well. Excellent. And the most appropriate shirt for tonight? Indeed, we are well, Brazil tonight. Well done, sir. Excellent, you got the memo. I didn't and went new <laughs> and went old world into Europe. Uh, Gary, welcome. Yeah. Thank you, mate. You know, I didn't get the memo either, so I've got the International Brigade shirt from the Spanish Civil War. Not quite <laughs> Latin American, but you know, it's 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 Spanish, slang language. So, yeah. um, so part two of your um, brainchild for this series, which actually we sort of came up with by accident following a following a chat with our special guest who's kept rather quiet and has been roped in for the, the long haul now uh, but yeah part two looking forward to it gary oh definitely you know and as you say the idea came when we had uh, our guest on world political football podcast the world cup series looking into argentina and this guy is such an authority on latin american football that I couldn't let him go couldn't let him go mate so <laughs> we created a series on, on south american football and we couldn't have a better guy to guide us through it than our special guest today, mate. You see, the only, the only thing that concerns me now, Gary, is when we get really good guests on, they're going to be a bit wary in case they get like roped into another time. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> we're going to tell them like this guy, like this guy here, we're going to tell them like him, then I'm going to get him on, on a series. I'm going to invent a series. I'm inventing a series for you this guy. So. To be fair, you did invent a series around the guest. I will. I, that is absolutely, probably that, that's the best introduction we can give him. Um, so obviously those who um, were here for part one will, will recognise those who weren't. Well, let me introduce uh, Mr. Peter Watson, lecturer in Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at the University of Leeds. Did his PhD thesis on Colombian politics and football, uh, focusing on how football was deployed towards nation building in Colombia during the presidency of Juan Manuel Santos uh, between 2010 and 2018. That's an incredibly long title, by the way. Uh, the focus was on how football was used in support of Santos peace negotiations uh, an eventual peace agreement with the Barguerias. Um, Peter's also written various articles, Spanish, English, on Colombian football, researches football in Latin America and probably more widely, including giving lectures on the importance of football in Brazil and Argentina, which I suppose just kind of underlines Gary's uh, rather impromptu but very well-placed decision on roping you in for a, a 10 pound series Pete, based on the on the on one episode so welcome back and thanks very much Stu. good to be back uh, yeah. you know? no i think they after that first episode the transfer fee went up through the roof you know i'm just kind of fielding calls from agents all over you know very well, super agents getting in touch you know so it's all good Luckily, luckily, we got there early. It, it sort of, I feel like we're a bit of a feeder club till the bigger, till the bigger ones pick you up. But, but that'd be now, very appropriate in Brazil, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. For now, we've got you, and we'll we'll just develop you into the finished article. Don't worry about that. Um, so obviously, Brazil. Um, we could talk for hours. We could do a whole series just on Brazil. Um, but where do we start? Origins of the game. You know, the origins of, of football in Brazil what it means to the people. We've got so much to talk about, but I suppose just an overview then really, Pete, of, of what football means to, to the nation of Brazil and its people. Yeah, and I think, I think it, I mean, it'll be something we say a lot about with a lot of the Latin American nations, but with Brazil, it's probably the most potent. I think a guy called Matthew Brown, who's written a lot about Latin American football and history, said that, you know, football in Brazil is kind of like the cultural trademark. It is the identity. It's, it's really when the whole world thinks of of Brazil, probably the first thing that comes into mind is going to be that yellow shirt. And again, you know, like a lot of the Latin American nations, you know, it's football through which Brazil faces the world. It tells the world about itself. You know, we, we, we kind of imagine an, an image of Brazil about how the nation plays its football. And I think that given, you know, the colossal success, the colossal impact that Brazil, Brazilian football and footballers, you know, male predominantly, but also female, if we think about Marta as well, you know, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's really hard to deny that, you know, if we're going to talk about the country of football, then Brazil is probably that country. 
it, I mean, Stephen, obviously, you know, you're, you're in that shirt that, that Pete mentioned. I mean, it is, I want to say, it, it, Pete's right, you know, if you, if you say football or you say Brazil, that the two just, just go together, um, inextri they are inextricably linked um, together, aren't they, the two entities? Yeah, like, like no other nation, you know, uh, I, think, I think if you, just, you stopped anyone on the street and, and just said, you know, think, give me the first thing you think of when we say the word Brazil, pretty sure most of them will say football. You know, even, even people who aren't football fans, I think they know, you know exactly what Brazil's all about and that passion for football. And that they are, you know, everyone, everyone knows the name Pele and the fact that, you know, Brazil would win World Cups. So, you know, they are football. You know, and, uh, and yeah, the, the, the nation is inextricably linked with its football team. I mean, Gary, you know, I'm sure, you know, once, once we get discussing with Pete and, um, you know, we'll probably revisit some of these World Cups. But I guess, you know, just recently, I think it was Sunday, I think, um, 50 years to the day that Brazil won, won the 1970 uh, World Cup final against Italy. You know, probably the most iconic team playing in the most iconic game of the most iconic tournament. Absolutely, yeah. Um... I mean, I, I'm sort of sadly I'm older to remember 1962 or vague recollections of 62 when they were in Chile. But yeah, 1970, and I think it was very much about the crack the commentary. It was, it was mystical almost, uh, the, the television presentation. It was, I think it was the first World Cup in colour, if memory serves me right. Um, but that was a wonderful team. I mean, you know, the, the forward line, Josina, Gerson, uh, Tostao. Pele, I mean, God, say Pele, Rivoli, you know, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, forward line. Uh, the, the, the last goal is, is sort of, um, I mean, if you want a coup de grace, I mean, you can't have a Frenchman delivering a coup de grace, you've got a Brazilian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Carlos Alberto was uh, building it wonderfully, that, and what a great, a great uh, move. And uh, I think the, the most poetic part of it was when Pele gets the ball on the edge of the area, and he almost stopped, he almost, I don't know if he actually put his foot on the ball, but he almost did and paused for a second and then rolled it onto Carlos Alberto's um, uh, a run and he smashed it home and you know it was a wonderful finish and uh, you know if any, if, if any um, moments for me um, epitomised Brazilian football that was it. Wonderful, wonderful. Jogo Benito, wonderful. <laughs> I mean you know Pete will you know I'd like to say we'll, we'll, you know, we'll come back round I'm sure we'll revisit 1970 again um, you know in, in this discussion but a little bit, I suppose, if we go right back to the very beginnings and a little bit about the really early history of, of, of Brazil's relationship with football. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, like, like most clubs in Latin America, um, you know, football is brought to Brazil by, by the British. Um, and I do mean British rather than English. It's actually Scots that are, are kind of the, the founding fathers, the kind of the, the people who brought um, football to Brazil. Uh, there used to be a legend that it was, well, not a legend, there used to be the story that was Charles Miller, who was a player from Southampton, that explains my, my topical jersey. Um, yeah, Charles Miller, who played for Southampton St. Mary's, is rumoured to have brought, you know, two footballs back in his bag after studying in, in Britain, took it back to Sao Paulo and, and created the, the first game uh, played between the Sao Paulo Railway Company and Gas Company. Uh, in 1894 but then there was actually a game before that it's not an 11 a side game but it kind of fits in with a, a narrative of you know Brazil for the more working class and, and for the, the black population as well and that took place only a few months before there's a chap called Thomas Donoghue uh, who again brought football to Rio de Janeiro and uh, was played in a kind of factory area in a place called Bangal uh, who've got a very very strong uh, identity as being one of the first teams that, that allowed black to play from them in, in I think 1905 1906 was the year that Blacks started to play for uh, for Bangal Football Club and again this is really important because it's only in 1888 that slavery is abolished in Brazil so there isn't there is a very short period of time between the abol abolition of slavery and then Blacks actually being accepted to play football but again you know football as the case is in most of Latin America it starts off as an elite game it's played in uh, British expat clubs and German and Italian expat societies and then gradually filters downwards to the working class to you know the, the common people who see this game are able to play it because it's very simplicity you know they're playing it on, on the waste grounds on any bit of, 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 of you know of street or, or field that they can 
you know, just because of this ease of play and because of those conditions that some of those early, you know, creative style and that imagination that we associate with, with, with Brazilian football is really created. So that's where it really begins. And I think that, the, you know, the first really important, you know, part of uh, Brazilian football and where, you know, there's a breakthrough really is in the 1920s where, you know, you have, a, you have various different leagues playing or leagues in, in Sao Paulo and in Rio de Janeiro and Rio Grande do Sul and the other cities. Because, again, Brazil is vast. We have to remember that this is a country that you can't easily get to. So it's, we don't have anything like a national league. We have different city leagues. And really Vasco da Gama make a huge breakthrough when they start introducing black players into this Rio de Janeiro league in 1923. You know, prior to that, they'd been banned. And it's an amazing story, actually. In 1916, um, the Brazilian team went to play in you know, the Copa America, or the previous version of the Copa America in Argentina. And one of the Argentinian newspapers prints out a, a picture with a cartoon saying uh, monkeys in Buenos Aires and they portray the the Brazilian team as monkeys because there is association with their players being black and the extent of this publicity which is obviously appalling for a nation that's trying to assert itself as modern and civilized leads to the fact that the Brazilian president actually re doesn't allow black players to play for the national team and it, they don't really play in, in the league until this Vasco da Gama team in the in the early 1920s. So there's some of the issues that you've got. You know, you've got this race issue, which is front and centre in Brazilian football history right from the very beginning. It's, I mean, you know, Stephen, this is, obviously, this is why Pete's here. <laughs> Clearly, us three really don't need to be here. We can just press record and we'll just go for a drink while Pete chats. But um, do you think, you know, Stephen, do you think that maybe, you know, more either could or should be made. You know, we talked at the beginning, you know, for the first sort of five minutes or so, and just eulogised about Brazil and, you know, the glorious football and, and the imagery and the associations. But do you think <clears throat> more should be made or more should be known about the origins of the game, um, you know, the early origins of the game, Brazil, especially, you know, as Pete's talked there, you know, about the horrendous race issues. You know, is it something that needs more awareness? I know it's a long time back and things have changed. I'm aware of that. You know, like we said about the association between football and Brazil, you know, as, as Pete's mentioned there, you know, the, the beginnings of it are so what we don't know and don't expect and don't associate. Yeah, I'd I, I agree with that. Uh, you know, it's still relevant today. You know, the, the whole Black, Li Black Lives Matter uh, movement, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, in some circumstances, you know, we've just seen a plane flown over Old Trafford, you know, uh, kind of decrying it. So, you know, it's still as relevant now. And, you know, for me, you, the mistakes of the past, the his, history is there to, to learn for a better future. It's not just a case of kind of, you know, finding out what happened and, and, and assimilating that. There are, there are lessons to be learned. There are, you know, I've always said with football, and it's not just football, but life in general, it repeats itself. You know, it comes out to a, a different slant, a different hat, a different, a different environment. But the same mistakes happen over and over again. And it's just how, you know, you look to the past and how that can be remedied in the future. And yeah, I, I'm a full believer in the fact that, you know, the wrongs of the past should be, you know, you should put your hands up to them. It, I mean, obviously, Gary, you know, you, you know, like I say, we, you, you know, you eulogised so eloquently about that, about that 1970 side. But obviously, you know, listen to what Pete said um, and, and sort of what we know now and what we associate with football. Do you think, do you think sort of those, those early beginnings formed a large part of how, I mean, you know, we'll talk about, you know, in a little while about culture, but do you think that started to form Brazil's relationship with football that we know now? You know, do you see that link from what Pete's just talked about to the game? sort of the contemporary game in Brazil? Yeah, I guess so. Um, and, and I bet Pete can probably check this for me, but I got, if I remember correctly, I think Pelé, when he started playing football, was called, he used to call him diesel or petrol or something like that because of his, his colour. And this is Pelé, so we're not going back. Well, I mean, okay, so Pelé was in his heart in the 70s. So, I mean, we're not going back to, you know, 50 years before then. Um, so there was, there's still that, that racism about there. And you know, Pele is the pearl, the black pearl. Um, then, then call Gerson the white pearl. So I suppose there's a sort of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
unplanned uh, race in the code from the past. But I guess um, the history of Brazilian football is a successful history of Brazilian football, certainly in later years, is built on multiracial um, on a ladder where so you've, you've got you've got you've got the, um, the, uh, the you've got the black people, you've got the white people, you've got in between the mulatto, I think they called them in Brazil, is that right, Peter? Yeah, yeah. Well, like um, so, so, you know, I think, um, yeah, the, you know, history is history of so many countries, and, now, and Britain's no exception, is, is very sad, but, you know, it's great sometimes to look, to look at the positives of how things have moved forward, and, you know, the great players in Brazil, uh, from now, you know, that, that sort of um, definition by colour is, is less uh, prevalent than the definition of, of ability and skill and uh, celebrity and um, uh, and uh, the way they perform and produce wonderful football. It's, I mean, it, it's a great segue in to into something that's like I say that it fascinates me. That the culture of the game is it, it, probably my favourite favourite subject, favourite topic, no matter which country or what era we're talking about. The relationship between the cultural elements of a country and the game absolutely fascinates me and probably none more so pete than than brazil you know the, the cultural relationship that it has with the game from you know from the, its very origins right up to you know to today you know the contemporary scene you know that they're like we said at the beginning they're inextricably linked with each other yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, I just want to, I'm just going to do one more little story about the, the racing. There's a, there's a guy that actually is forced to uh, put rice powder on his face to try and whiten up in, I think, the early, in the late 1910s or like in the 20s. I want to say his name's Carlos Alberto. I think he was known as, as Paul de, de Arroz, uh, kind of rice powder. But again, the, 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 you know, the race issue is really central to the identity of Brazil and the cultural identity of the country. Um, because you have in, 19, in the 1930s, there's a, a chap called Getulio Vargas who, who becomes president. He's effectively a dictator. And he is trying to create a Brazilian national identity. You know, Brazil is very disparate. It's kind of a, a country of regionalisms of, you know, Sao Paulo is different from Rio de Janeiro. And that's different than the south. That's different than the north. And so they need to try and find something that unites people. And they also need to try and find something unique that unites the people because they've got an extremely large black and mulatto population that has to be found a place and has to be, you know, try and bring them to support this political project. And it's football and samba that do that. And these are both black or mulatto styles, you know, the samba style of music, which emerges in Rio de Janeiro at the time played by black musicians. And that is account that is accompanied by the rise of black footballers. And some of the main ones, the most famous one is a guy called Leonidas who kind of, if he doesn't exist, it's a strong argument to say that the likes of, you know, Pelé and the other black footballers that ilk don't get, don't get to be on the same level because Leonid, Leonidas was the trailblazer. He was the, you know, the black diamond. He was the player that went to 1938 to the World Cup and absolutely, you know, wowed the crowds in Europe. You know, and this is a black man just before the First World War, being the top scorer, performing feats of artistry. He's falsely, you know, attributed the, the creation of the, of, the, of the bicycle kick, the scissor kick goal. It wasn't him, it was a Chilean. But, you know, this is the kind of legend that grows up about Leonidas. And when this, this black team, this team of Brazilians in which black players like Leonidas, like Domingos de Guia, like the great Tim, who doesn't sound like he should be a Brazilian footballer, but was, almost like Fred, isn't it? But these are, these are the footballers that create the Brazilian football identity and the way they play associated with this samba style of music and associated with the, the works of a guy called Gilberto Freire, who is a kind of sociologist, anthropologist, who's trying to define what Brazilian identity is and defining it on more lateral terms, the fact that it is not a white country, it is a black and white country. So these three things, you know, the music, the football, and this new political process come together at a time when Brazilian football is succeeding on a world level. And it's there where that Brazilian identity is created that continues through, you know, to the present day really. It's, I, I've got a tricky question for you in a minute, Stephen. I'm really sorry. So just be ready. <laughs> but Gary, before before we come to Stephen, um, the you know we, I know we always seem to come back to this, and, and they always seem so inextricably linked again. But the, you know the sort of the political football podcast. You know we I think we've done a couple of, of editions on Brazil from different perspectives, and I suppose again, 
you know, we, we talk about the cultural inference and, and relationship between the game, but there's also a massive political influence that permeates the game as well. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's not dissimilar, I guess, to what, to what we're discussing in the Columbia one, where the success in the football field um, helps the political um, elite at the time. Um, you know, it, it's it's not it's not an unusual phenomenon for I mean across the world I mean you know the, the famous one is sitting in the country where I am he was like Franco he used to wrap himself around Real Madrid's success um, even though he was uh, he was Galician he was certainly wasn't uh, Castilian um, so yeah it's uh, it's it's important that um, and, and and the Argentina one obviously when we had Pete on the particular football the Argentina World Cup. Um, that the success of the of the team there was um, was uh, transmogrified. I'm not sure if that's the right word. Into a success for the elite of the political um, the the uh, uh, military hunter at the time, and it's 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 a thin line that often gets blurred. Um, nobody likes a loser. Everybody likes a winner. And uh, you know, if you, if the uh, the ruling um, party, the ruling elite at the time can associate themselves with success in the football field, especially in countries like South America, where football is so important. It's a massive thing. It, 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 like I say, you know, the, the, the three strands that, that, you know, that Pete mentioned now, I just want to come back to you, Stephen. I'm, I'm really sorry, but this, this cultural, you know, like I say, this cultural association, it absolutely fascinates me. You know, it does, but obviously the game has moved on so much and, you know, you look at, you know, you look at players like Neymar, um, you know, who comes across to Europe and so many of the, of the very top level Brazilian players, you know, now move across to Europe. And it's, it's perhaps only when the national team sort of get together that maybe the nation can fully sort of celebrate its relationship with football. And this, like I said, this, this cultural association that we've all sort of grown up with, do you think that's still as relevant today, bearing in mind the amount of movement that now exists from Brazil across to Europe of the very highest quality players? I think it'll still be there in some, some form or, or another, but it'll be diluted compared to what it used to be. You know, players are picked up at a very, very young age now. You know, the concept of, of, uh, of, of players playing themselves out of, of the slums you know, is lessened somewhat because any player with talent will be recognised at the age of six or seven. And they'll be kind of like cocooned and taken to clubs, but yeah, you know, it's 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 still that, you know, that concept of anything is possible for anyone in Brazil. You know, no matter how rough life is, you know, football will always be there, and there'll always be a chance that you know the the next the next Pele, the next Rivelino, the next Zico, the next you know Garincha can rise from absolutely anywhere, but. Yeah, the, these these players are recognised at a very early age, taken to the big cities where they're assimilated into the club academies, from where they are picked off by European sides. So you know there, there is a fast track in here. You know we're, we're not we're not talking about the days of, you know not not Brazil, but you, know, you look at Argentina and Maradona, and his rise from from you know playing on a dusty track and and that that epic footage of him. To, to rise in through you know the the ranks of Argentinos juniors and then Boca juniors and then off to Europe, you know it, it is still a well worn path for for South American players to make, but it is done much swifter, and it's also a case of you know the, the barriers in football have come down. You know it wasn't so long ago I, I can't remember what the book was now, but. Um, reading about a, a cluster of players who went to play in the Faroe Islands from Brazil. So that, that concept, it's not even the best players. It's the fact that you are a Brazilian professional footballer means that you have that status, you know, any club anywhere in the world to be able to say, we have our Brazilian number 10 is just absolutely massive. And, and I can't, it's got, I'm going to kick myself about, about which book this was in. But yeah, is that, yeah. Yeah, it's Alex Bellos, but yeah. That's right, it was, yeah, yeah, Alex Bellos's book, it's brilliant, yeah. And and the interviews with them and how one stayed and he met a girl and, and, and it's the, the combat and the weather and the, and the, you know, and everything. So still, yes, that cultural aspect of leaving home behind for this foreign land. So yes, it's still going to be there, but in, in, a, in a diluted manner in some ways, but it'll still be very, very, very pronounced and a, and a huge spike for those 
circumstances like Alex Bowles' book that uh, that talks about the players who went to play in the Faroe Islands. It, just I just I stood just for a moment yeah. there. Um, I mean, uh, here where I live, we have a football team, a football club here, which are pretty blooming useless. Um, called Dipper Deportivo da Talarica. Uh, they're in the sixth tier now, regionalised. And if they get relegated again, they're going to be playing the under twelve girls team from the school. Obviously. But they have a Brazil. They had a Brazilian player playing for us last year. Uh, Cruz and uh, yeah, he was Brazilian, and people knew he was Brazilian. I didn't know anything about any of the other players, but I knew this guy was Brazilian. So just people, what Stevie said, you know, that aura of a Brazilian player, and he played in me. It was the best player we, uh, we had. Um, it still, it still conjures up that magical image of the Canaria shirt and uh, the mystique of Brazil. It's, I mean. Like I said, I mean, it's funny, you know, we, we touched there on, you know, on players sort of leaving, uh, you know, leaving the, the Brazilian league, the top players even, and coming across to Europe, Pete. But something that's all that I've, I've struggled to, to sort of get my head around is, is the domestic scene in, in Brazil. You know, like, you know, you mentioned earlier about the sheer scale and size of the country and it, you know, the actual, you know, the league system there, the domestic game there seems so convoluted and complicated to me. So, yeah. not only do you want to explain it to the viewers, but to me as well would be a really big help. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's really complicated. I mean, again, you know, again, Brazil is vast, you know, and again, a lot of the cities, it's difficult to get there. You know, you're, you're really looking at plane is the only way you can get to cities. And again, for a long time, this just isn't feasible. It's just not economic. Clubs are not, are not going to be able to do that. So really what happened was, is that the leagues are really originally based around cities. You know, you have the kind of the Liga Paulista, the kind of Sao Paulo League. You have the Carioca League in Rio. You have the Mineral in the um, in uh, Minas Gerais. You have leagues in the north in Paraná, Bahia, uh, down the south in Rio Grande do Sul. And then originally, you know, the, the teams are playing in those leagues and that's it, you know. And then there are occasional meetings. But then increasingly, as you know, as the kind of transport and communications infrastructure uh, starts to starts to you know take effect. Um, it becomes more possible for there to be a, you know a Brazilian league, and but we're not really looking into. I mean, it's not so. I think 1959 when there is a kind of a, a first proper stab at this, um, but then I think really it's from 1971 when it's really considered to be what it is at the moment. But the problem is is that you have the national league, which will include teams from you know Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte. Uh, Recife, um, Porto Alegre, you know, all, all the kind of main Brazilian cities. They'll all be playing in that league, but they'll also be playing in their city or their regional league as well. So you have this ridiculous scenario where the teams are playing, you know, a ridiculous amount of games every week for their local regional league and the national league, whichever division they're in. And potentially, if you're any good, you're playing in the Copa Libertadores or the, the you know, the Sur Americana as well. So, and it used to be the situation where, you know, the biggest clubs, you know, the biggest clubs in Rio and, and Sao Paulo would be almost playing two teams. You know, it'd be a team that would be playing the, um, the you know, the regional league and a team that would be playing the national league. And this, to some extent, explains why, you know, look at Pelé, the amount of games he played for Santos, you know, and the amount of goals he scored for Santos. It's probably because he was playing, you know, three, t three games a week and then playing on all the club games, the tour games, the festival games that Santos arranged to make the most of, of Pele and this particular generation. So it is extremely busy, convoluted, uh, hard-working league. Uh, it is one of the most successful in, in the world. I think it's the fifth or sixth in terms of, you know, money generated, I'm not mistaken. So, but it, it is complicated. It is. I mean, Stephen, I'll, you know, I'll come to you in, in a second about sort of... Um, intercontinental um, cup success for, for particular reasons um, for those who know their football history but you know Gary it, it always strikes me why why South American football the viewing of South American football doesn't have more of a foothold or more of a presence I mean obviously I can only speak for the UK I don't know how much Brazilian football is shown in Spain or on the continent but it, South America, league football in South America just doesn't seem to be able to get a foothold television wise in Europe no, it doesn't. And it might be certain in, in sort. And I guess there's almost sort of like a contradictory thing here because now we have the technology to it to happen, but we also have the money where players aren't 
the top players aren't in Brazil anymore, and the top players are in Europe. Um, they're whisked away, you know. They, you know, and we were talking earlier about. I think Stephen was mentioned about Maradona playing on dusty streets. And when we did the Celtic mag a, a while ago, uh, Jimmy Johnston mentioned that uh, the Celtic players were very much the Scottish players were very much like the Brazilian players. They were brought up playing football on the street, not in an academy. You know, not with sorts of uh, 14 coaches telling them different, different ways to play. They were playing with a tennis ball sometimes. They were playing with a rolled up ball of rags sometimes. That's how they learned to play. They're playing football on the streets. And I guess those sort of days have, have, have sort of gone a little bit now. And, uh, you know, Messi's a good example. Whisked away from our South America very early into uh, Barcelona's academy. And the great players of Brazil don't play in Brazil. They don't play in the South American leagues anymore. They play in the European leagues. And so perhaps the... Um, attraction of, of uh, Brazilian football, Brazilian domestic football, isn't there because the great stars aren't there either. Um, I did an article a while ago for um, these couple of times about uh, Cotatiba, is that the pronunciation, Pete? Um, who won the, um, the Brasileira uh, a while ago and, and came from nowhere. And uh, we had a, a we did a, um, uh, a pod on uh, the Chapacanisa, 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 sorry, thanks, Pete. Um, tragedy, and they are a team who sort of seem to sort of come from nowhere to win it because the big teams haven't got the great players anymore, perhaps, and so these sort of things can happen. Um, so it may be that you know the attraction for uh, Brazilian domestic football in Europe isn't there, as I said, because the great players aren't there. Which is not much sad, I suppose, really. It is, like you say, it's, it's, the technology's arrived and the players have gone. It's, it's, just, it's just too late. Um, obviously, Stephen, for us, our sort of introduction to, to club football in, in Brazil comes in the 81 um, World Club Competition Intercontinental Cup, whatever it, its guys was, and the, the fixture in Tokyo against, against a very, very good Liverpool side, you know, reigning European champions. And, and you know, they come up against Flamengo and it's it's just a different game you know it's a different game played out. yes it's Liverpool have travelled halfway across the world it's the middle of the season and but it's it's still a, a different type of game that probably we're introduced to in this country for the first time oh yeah undoubtedly you know this, this was a, a magical game I, I can remember sitting up watching it I thought live I mean I've looked back now and, and, and looked at the the, the uh, TV listings and, and at the times great online website uh, and, and it seems to have been kind of like recorded highlights but I'm sure in the in the northwest we watched it live in the middle of the night or very early in the morning and I can just remember being just in awe of this this flamengo side that left a, a lasting imprint to the fact that I was delighted that we got to play them again uh, last year in the effectively the modern day version of the tournament and not not to 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 get revenge and to beat them or anything like that just the fact that it was flamengo and that we'd had this epic game this legendary game against them where we were gave, gave a, a footballing lesson and uh, and it was the it, this this was uh, zico you know absolutely you know it, it was it was it was a, an honor to be to be torn apart by zico and that was the way that i know i saw it then I was a child, you know, my dad being in awe and, and saying that this is a team of, of you know, such massive significance. And the fact that I'd remembered watching um, England play Brazil a few months earlier at Wembley, and I'm sure it was between the two FA Cup final games, so Man City and, and, uh, and Tottenham played on the Saturday, England played Brazil on the, on the Tuesday night, and then the FA Cup final replay was played on the Thursday and uh, Zico scores this, this again, just stunning goal. Uh, and and I, I was just transfixed uh, from, from there. So the, the chance to watch him in a Flamengo shirt was just a magical thing because, as you say, you know, Brazilian football, South American football across the board, the club game very rarely gets any erring in the UK. You know, I remember the very early days of Channel 4. We, we did get some Brazilian football. I can remember Martin Tyler doing the commentaries and a lot of Santos was played, and but it was a short-lived experiment, and it and it drifted off again. But yes, these these World Club Championship games were just, you know, they they were great. You know, they were absolutely fantastic to be able to watch. You know, 
the European side, not the European side, the, the, any British side playing in it, English side as it would be in the 80s, didn't necessarily take it as seriously as they the, the, the should have done. You know, the, the travel arrangements weren't great. They'd fly in 48 hours before the South American sides would go in and spend a week and acclimatise to Tokyo. They, they'd be ready for it. So, you know, there was that aspect to it. So for me, within that, I'd always be, be rooted for the South American side against the, against the certainly against the English side because they'd taken it seriously. The Italians were very, very different. They took it very seriously. They, they thought it was you know, absolutely massive games to be a, a part of and to be world club champions was, was absolutely huge. But yes, these, these games were you know, just a brilliant eye-opener upon you know, the Brazilian domestic game and these, these magical names and these teams and you know, fantastic kits, those, those red and black yeah. hoops. You know, still, still, not not haunt me, but uh, no, yeah, they, they've always stayed with me. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's funny going. You know, this is we're almost going from the sublime to the ridiculous in terms of the the, the almost hidden secret of, of domestic football and league football in Brazil, Pete. And then we look on the international scene, and obviously, you know, Brazil suffered that well national tragedy, as it's called, um, in 1950 against Uruguay, and then from there, it's it's almost becomes, you know, the World Cup becomes an obsession for the entire nation and, and remains an obsession even, even to today. No, I mean, that's completely right. And in, in the words you use there, Stuart, spot on. I mean, the, the 1950 World Cup final, uh, I mean, the whole tournament was a chance for Brazil to show itself to the world. You know, it had the biggest stadium, the Maracanã. It was, it was there to say, you know, Brazil has arrived. We are a modern nation. And it was it was all set up to win. And so, you know, when, when they lost that final against against Uruguay, it was a national tragedy. It was felt like a natural national tragedy. It was it was possibly Brazil's, you know, greatest tragedy as a nation they've suffered. You know, this is a nation that's you know, it's had a few wars and so on, but you know, nothing really in the national imaginary compares to that. And again, you know, going back to the you know, kind of race issues that kind of permeate, you know, Brazilian football, the goalkeeper Barbosa. You know, was blamed until his death for losing that, as were the defenders Juvenal and Bigode, who were who were also black, and so so that was a problem. But as you rightly say, you know, it becomes an obsession, and Brazil has this kind of need to need to win. This, it has to they, you know to, to confirm themselves as a nation, to, con, to confirm this this pride and faith they 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 want to have. They need to win the you know the world's biggest football trophy and you know, when they do and when they you know dominate really from 58 through to 1970 with the you know the exception of, of 1960 this is you know when uh, the, the, the nation of brazil and the political regimes that are sustained by these continuing triumphs is really embedded and again it is the great era you know obviously you know um, gary's already mentioned a lot of the names but you know garincha is another one you know someone who is you know they're called the joy of the people and again, you know, that explains it more than anything else. This is a person who comes from the people and plays for the people. He doesn't play for politicians. He doesn't really play for the club, necessarily. He just plays football. And that's what Brazilians love about the game, really, that it is a people's game. And again, you know, there is a, there's a, you know, at the end of the 1970s, to kind of fulfil this idea is that there's, some, there's a statistic that 90% of people interviewed after the World Cup victory in 1970 say that football is the epitome of Brazilian identity. So I think, I think that really, really does state it. And again, Brazil towers over the rest of the world for this, this period. And it is, you know, for a, you know, a third world nation that, can, that has always been told it's inferior to Europe, to the North. This is a period where South American football asserts its pride on a kind of geopolitical stage on that kind of level as well as a football level. It's, I mean, it, you know, it's a great point. And I know we keep, you know, I keep coming back to this, Gary, but, you know, we, we talk about how, you know, football can provide distraction, how football can, can unify a, a nation, you know, and I don't want it to sound like football can heal all the ills of the world. I, you know, I don't mean that for a minute, but, but certainly, you know, Brazil's relationship with the World Cup and thereby the national team's relationship with, with the, you know, the Brazilian public, you know, again, you know, we mentioned it about, you know, being synonymous with the game, but, you know, Brazil, the World Cup and its people, that triumph of it there, you know, it's so, it's so strong and, and so well bound together. Oh, absolutely is. And uh, I read a piece, uh, the Pele 
uh, said that um, in the World Cup when they lost to Uruguay, it was the first and only time that he'd ever seen his father cry. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's sort of, I mean, it might, it might be a little sort of dramatic effect, but um, it's what it meant. And there's a, there's a, I think there's a museum, I, I, I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe there's a museum not far from Maracanã uh, when uh, Uruguay scored. There's, they've got this film on a, a, um, on a roll of the game and when Uruguay score there's a this is took in the background and when uh, Uruguay scored the second goal it stopped and it said the heart of Brazil stopped beating or something I, I, I might have the translation correct but it's something like that it just emphasizes that um how how the two uh, the two halves of the heart that is Brazil and football are inextricably and forever uh, linked, um, and you know the 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 fact that um, Brazil won the World Cup in 1958, won it in 1962, were kicked out of the tournament in 66, kicked up, well, not kicked out, but kicked up in the air in the tournament, so literally bullied out of the tournament in 66. They won it in 70. This this um, that generation of footballers was probably the greatest generation over over a dozen years that football has ever seen, has ever seen. And, um, you know, if you're going to have a, a generation to cement football into the heart of a nation, by God, that one did it. That one did it and did it do it so well. It's, it's, it's funny, I mean, you know, talking about, you know, talking about great sides and, you know, I would say being synonymous with the game. Um, in a second, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come to you all for sort of notable players or, you know, your sort of favourite Brazilian footballer. But obviously, Stephen, there's no way we're going to let this episode go past without some mention of, 982. Now, that Brazil, the Brazil side of 82 and 86, arguably, is probably the last, for me, the last throws of, of the sort of sides that, that Pete and Gary have mentioned there, you know, 58, 62, 70. Then there's the slight aberrations in 74, 78, 82, it comes back, 86, it's fading. And, and then because there's this, you know, the prolonged period of, of no success, having had so much success, International football in Brazil slightly changes for me, almost irreversibly. Oh, completely. You know, the, the, that, it's that, I don't know, some of the joy is lost somewhere. You know, uh, some, the prize becomes more important than the, the means of the football. You know, but I can kind of understand that. You know, by the time that, you know, failure to win in 82, when they, they really should win in 82, it's 12 years it's got to be another four before they can do it again. Santana you know, has another roll with the dice in 86. So after that, you know, I can remember 1990, they were very Europeanized in their approach. Um, I think Colombia were probably the most you know, authentic South American side at the 1990 World Cup. Uh, I can remember feeling so massively let down by Brazil. Not that they went out in the last 16, but just the, you know, the football that they played felt like a betrayal of the side that I'd loved in 82 and that I'd willed to, to put 82 right in 86, but knowing full well that, you know, it was going to be beyond them. Uh, but yes, that 82 side for me was just, just so evocative. And um, Gary mentioned it before as, you know, the, for, for 1970 and, and how the, the crackly commentaries and that, that shimmery haze on the screen just spoke of kind of like, you know, the, a World Cup in a far off place, you know, commentary that sounds like the surface of the moon. And it's, you know, it, it just had everything. You know, I, I'd love there to be a red button facility at the next major tournament to be able to kind of like put that crackly commentary on. <laughs> you know, I'd absolutely adore it because uh, I'd be pressing it. <laughs> but yeah, that 82 side, you know, I, I think, at, and not knowing at the time when I was watching it through, through the eyes of, you know, how old I was, eight, nine, whatever it was. And, and just the joy of the football and the vibrancy and the brightness of the of the kits and and the style of the players and and Zico was was so much you know, a part of that you know in tandem with Socrates, and it was just the way that they played and and looking further down the line uh, when I come to read up on on how they'd altered again, so they'd won in seventy seventy four they'd you know kind of gone into that World Cup trying to get the punch in first. I think mindful, Zagallo mindful of what had happened in 66 when he wasn't part of it, you know, Fiola 
who'd been the Brazil's World Cup winning coach in 58, had led them again in 66 in England. And as Gary said, they were they were kicked off the pitches. You know, and I think Zagallo was mindful of, of 66. It explains a lot behind the, his approach to 74. Doesn't make it right. You know, he went too far. Uh, and then by 78 under Claudio Catino, there's a, you know, a, an, evol- no, an attempt to go back to the future. Uh, no, tragic Claudio Catino, you know, he, he died, you know, scuba diving accident. And in comes Telly Santana, he takes it on. And, and yes, you know, you look at someone like Zico and he bought into all of that, this attempt to, to revisit 1970 and the golden days of Brazilian football to the point that, you know, he, he delayed taking his own club career into Europe. You know, he stayed in Brazil. He won the Libertadores, you know, he won the World Club Cup. He was South American Player of the Year. You know, he, he was like 29 by the time he ventured into Serie A, which by the time he'd done that, you know, the, the big clubs were were unwilling to take the chance on him, you know, thinking that his best days were over. He ended up playing at Udinese, put in a fantastic career at Udinese, but, you know, the chance to to win things in Serie A with one of the giants had, had passed him by, by the fact that he'd, he'd stayed in Brazil as being part of this preparation in going to the 1982 World Cup. And, uh, and yeah, just, and, and the fact that Zico was such a, a hardworking player as well. You know, he was, the, he was the, the archetypal number 10, but it, there wasn't a selfish bone in his body. You know, he, he, was, he was for the collective. He was happy to set up more than, you know, as much as he was to take the glory of scoring the goals himself. You know, I think it's the goal against Argentina that always strikes me. It's just, you know, how when the ball hits the bar and, and Fiol is trying to, to, to scramble to, to grab hold of it, that Zico's the first one in there, you know, and, and you know, he's run from 20 yards, 15, 16, 20 yards to get there. Just, it, it's, it's not the greatest goal that Zico ever scored, but I think it's the most telling goal he ever scored. It's, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's funny that, you know, you talk about, I won't start, I won't make a start on the H2O year all day. But in, in terms of, you know, players there, I mean, you know, like I said, there's, there's so much we could talk about with Brazilian football, you know, and so much we could carry on with. But I just want to give you all a chance before we finish to pick, you know, to pick your own player. It, you know, it can be a player that best sums up the Brazilian philosophy or, you know, a player that maybe means more to you than any other. You know, the criteria is irrelevant. Um, but, you know, just, just a player each. Um, to, to sort of chat about really and obviously to direct people as we like to as we're already as this will be on YouTube they can just open up another window when we're finished and they can have a look at your player in action um, Pete you're the guest you can go first you've got all of Brazil's players through okay. here that's a, that's a great choice I think I'm going to go with Garincha, uh because I think you know, uh, you know for a, a sport about the people and played in a certain way and associated with a certain way of football you know, you almost have to look at Ganincha for, you know, the dribble, you know, the little bird, this, 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 this guy who was born with, you know, a, a kind of deformity, a curved spine and problems with his legs, who, you know, is, is, you know, apparently so stupid and had such a low IQ that, you know, the, the, the kind of very almost militaristic training, uh, you know, of some of the Brazilian training has four World Cups didn't even want to consider him to play. This is a guy who, you know, who would beat someone and then do it again and then do it again just for a laugh. You know, the first, the first kind of time he, he went to Botafogo, he, he, you know, he nutmegged the, um, I can't remember, it was Nilton Santos, is it? Um, yes. Yeah. He, you know, he, he, he nutmegs on his, for the very first time in his pitch. And this is a guy who is an absolute genius on the pitch and an absolute disaster off it. You know, he, you know, I mean, if he was a footballer nowadays, he would, you know, he would either be sectioned or put in jail or, you know, would be being ripped to pieces on Twitter or, or the press. You know, he had he had 14 children, you know, maybe more. You know, he, he basically drank himself into an early grave. He killed his mother in a, in a car crash. Um, you know, but somehow, you know, despite all these incredible failings and dis- despite this, the great limitations that he had, you put him on a football pitch and he turned into a magician. And I think that's kind of something we all adore as a football fan, someone who can just play and just create and plays with joy and that's why he was you know the joy of the people so get in check great choice uh gary will we'll, we'll come to you next you can pick anyone from brazilian football apart from garincha well garincha would have been my second choice but to me 
you mentioned Brazilian football, but it's only one. There's only one, and that's Pele. And I, you know, I, I, we we sort of talk on on <laughs> on podcasts and vlogs about you know how old how old I am and things I can remember. But I, I you know, I delight. I, I take massive delight in being able to remember Pele playing at his height. And this, to my mind, and you know, okay, everybody has, di has different opinions. To my mind, he's the greatest footballer of all time. And that, you know, it's difficult to sort of pick another player when you think that's true. Um, you know, 1958 as a teenager, won the World Cup. Um, he was outstanding 12 years later, even after being kicked up in the air in 1966 and said he wouldn't play again. Uh, um, just a magic, magic, magical football. 19 said two things in 1970, and I remember these so well. <clears throat> the first one was against Czechoslovakia and a group game, you know, both, both, both group games, and he tried to chip uh, Victor from the halfway line. Now, you see Beckham's done it recently and ruined it. I've never seen anybody do it before, and certainly not on a World Cup stage. And they were playing, they played uh, Uruguay, and uh, the Uruguay goalkeeper, Mazurkovic, who was an outstanding goalkeeper, probably the best goalkeeper in South America at the time. And the ball was played to Pele. It might have come from Jairzinho, or might have been much sure. And in the most extravagant dummy in the history of football you've ever seen in your life, where he stepped over him. And it was almost like um, at the Cruyff turn, you know, when the guy, Olsen, the guy, the, the Swedish defender, you know, he, got, he goes dummy so far away they had to buy a ticket to get in the stadium. We had to get a taxi to get back first because he got that far the wrong way. All the circuits were very similar. And Pele sort of looped around him and chased back and got the ball. But he, he decided to prove he was human and he rolled it past the post rather than into the net. Um, so to me, the greatest football, certainly the greatest football I could ever remember playing. And I've seen some great, I've seen some fantastic plays in my lifetime. You know, Cruyff, George Best. Rodinho, Ronaldo, both, both versions, Messi. To me, Pele is the best football I've ever seen in my life, so I would go with Pele every day of the week, all day long, 24 hours a day. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter who you pick now, Stephen. Um, you, you can pick who you want, apart from the two of the guys who picked, but clearly they won't be the best, so good luck with that. Well, that's a, you, you could only go with a, 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 at your most impressionable. You know, or or someone that you are transfixed by, and for me, you know, I've already got Zico in there, so I'm going to turn to his his uh, partner in crime and uh, and Socrates. You know, it's just the whole package when it comes to Socrates. You know, the ease and the fluidity of his movements, and the you know the the third eye brain that he that he had. You know, just so laconic and and relaxed on the ball, like anything was possible. You know, he, he was such a, a laid back footballer and it's the the on pitch the on pitch and off pitch intelligence of him as well. And the fact that he was such a campaigner, you know, for for for, for what he felt was right, you know, a, a socialism of, of some some description, if you wanna call it socialism, it's good fine by me. Uh, you know, he it, it just had absolutely everything. You know, the personality, the player, the human being. And uh, and it's that frailty within it as well, you know, to come so close or you know to 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 for a World Cup to to be there to reach out and claim not once but twice, and uh, and yeah, you know, for me, Socrates was absolutely everything. Whereas Zico was a a generator, he was perpetual motion. So Socrates was the heartbeat. He dictated that side. He was the he was the conductor. You know, and and just think everything about Socrates is absolutely fascinating, and and you know he would fit into any era of football as well. He would play, he would be you know play, he could play now, you know if you if you, you got a time machine, picked him up and brought him back, he could play now without a shadow of a doubt. You know, uh, and and he was just that good. It's, I mean, it's, it's funny, like you say. I mean, obviously, you know, as people know, you and I are the same, exactly the same age, same generation. And, you know, at age two as a kid, I always wanted to be Zico in the playground. Um, and doing, doing the research for the, for the project that I'm doing at the moment, and, and I've, spoken, I've spoken to players, commentators, referees, managers, all from, from that tournament. And one of the questions I've, I've asked them all is, you know, who for you stood out in that side, that age two side? And 
every single person, bar none, have, have called Socrates as the greatest player they'd ever they'd ever come up against, played against. They just, you, you know, you, you just said you, you just had to watch it. You just had to watch him to see see what he was capable of. If you if you weren't in the stadium or on the sideline, you couldn't fully appreciate what he did in the game. And every single one of them, nobody picked Zico, uh, nobody picked Falcao, you know, and, uh, you know, all have great tournaments, but everybody, every single person eulogized over Socrates at that tournament and just how good and how influential he was and how, how they had, they very much, not underrated him going into the game, but they, they didn't realize just how good a footballer he actually was until they were on the sideline. And then, uh, they were just transfixed by, I remember speaking to uh, John Hansen, who was the New Zealand manager, you know, and they, they almost, they got to a stage where they willed him to have the ball. The New Zealand bench willed him to, to get the ball so they could watch to see what he did. You know, they were almost tempted to tell, to, to tell the team to give it or give it to him and let's see what he can do. You know, they, they just willed him to have the ball just, just so they could watch him. Um, and like I say, which sort of surprised me a little bit. Um, I suppose, you know, we, we've sort of come up to, you know, we're sort of 45 minutes, guys, which, you know, we're about there. But one more point from you, Pete, before we finish. You know, just a little bit really about, you know, about the future of Brazilian football and, and where you see it going. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I was listening to a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a pod series or an, a, an interview with, with David Goldblatt, who's written a lot about the world game. And, and he thinks that, you know, there's a strong case for thinking that a South American nation might never win the World Cup again. Um, I, I disagree. I think I think that's a, a slightly disappointing. I hope I hope that doesn't happen. I think South American football's got a lot to offer, and particularly Brazil. I think that um, I think it, I can't remember if it was Steve or, or Gary was talking earlier about the amount of players that that leave. And again, the bigger this is the biggest problem for Brazil. Brazil has always been an exporter to the world. It's almost like a plant. It's a, been a plantation economy for years with with sugar and coffee, and it's almost like footballers are like that now. There's, there's something ridiculous. I think there's a, a thousand two hundred footballers playing across the world now from Brazil, and that that you know dilutes the game. It it lacks the kind of na- the coherence and the cohesion that that you know Brazilian football needs. And I think that one of the biggest problems that Brazil has is actually with the idea of cultural identity. You know, I think Brazilians and the world kind of want Brazil to play in this stylish free-flowing, imaginative way. But that's really not how the modern game works. You know, this is a game that is, you know, it's regimented, it's highly trained, it's orchestrated, it's tactically, you know, strong. And again, Brazil has, is kind of battling with an identity here, whether it wants to be associated with this kind of slightly problematic imagination of the stylistic but lazy but undisciplined but incredibly creative player. That ties in with that identity that we love about Brazil. But then again, that has certain negative connotations the way Brazil is seen as well. You know, does it want to be seen as a nation that is great, that is modern, that is divert, that is organised, that can produce great players but can play as a team, as a nation? You know, and I think that's something that Brazil's got to wrestle with. I think it's got every potential, you know, you know it's got to convey a bend of players, but they've just got to find a way to, to keep them together, to play together, to use their best characteristics and to and to decide what their identity really is and how they're actually going to move forward. But because of their population, the demographics, the way the population works, they're always going to produce great players. And at some point, they will put it together again. And I think, you know, win a World Cup again, you know, when they can. So, you know, there are problems ahead. There are difficult questions they've got to answer. But, you know, they've got more raw materials than, than anyone else to, to be a successful footballing nation. Brilliant. It, it, like I say, Pete, I, I can see why Gary's roped you in for 10 episodes. Um, fellas, you know, it, like I say, we could talk about Brazil, you know, all night. I'll do a whole series on Brazil, on Brazil and its relationship with football. Um, Gary, happy with, with episode two, how it went? Brilliant, brilliant. And, and that was a great, that was great for you for Pete as well, you know. Um, you know I want to I sort of have that... Um, that's uh, hope, that's um, expectation, that aspiration that Brazil will entrance us again in the future. So, you know, I hope you're right, Pete. I hope you're right, buddy. Um, Stephen, first of all, thank you for joining us. Two, you must be desperate to get away because this has been um, recorded on the night that, that Chelsea play Manchester City and Liverpool 
might win the <laughs> <top of the laughs> years. I noticed over my shoulder there. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and yeah, Chelsea yeah. one nil up. Five minutes away now. <laughs> so I'll, obviously, I'll, I'll. It looks like you you maybe start to relax a little bit now about the time. You can't, you can't, you can't relax when Pep Guardiola is still <laughs> to, 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 to um, see. You. Yeah, as ludicrous as it sounds, with seven games to go. Yeah. Um, Steve, 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 sit in, sit in each snookers, mate. You'll be okay. Snookers, <laughs> Guardiola is a very good snooker player. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll let you go and hopefully bask in the in the next forty five minutes. Um, right. Pete, obviously, you can't go anywhere. You'll be exactly there the next time we need you. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. Um, and like I say. First of all, thank you for explaining the domestic scene for me um, in Brazil. That was much appreciated. <laughs> yeah. um, and as always, you know, your knowledge is, is wonderful and it's, you know, it's, it's why we've got you. You're the best in the business. Uh, it's very kind of you, Stu. No, it's great to talk about it. Again, you know, so many stories, so many things that, you know, we can do again. We can chat about it again, but now it's always fun to talk about it, isn't it? So, great stuff. Brilliant. And obviously, thanks for watching and we'll see you in part three of the South America Files. Thank you. See you later.